Miscellaneous Writings, Chapter 4, Addresses Science and the Senses Substance of My Address at the National Convention in Chicago, June 13, 1888 The National Christian Scientist Association has brought us together to minister and to be ministered unto, mutually to aid one another in finding ways and means for helping the whole human family, to quicken and extend the interest already felt in a higher mode of medicine, to watch with eager joy the individual growth of Christian scientists, and the progress of our common cause in Chicago, the miracle of the Occident. We come to strengthen and perpetuate our organizations and institutions and to find strength in union, strength to build up, through God's right hand, that pure and undefiled religion whose science demonstrates God and the perfectibility of man. This purpose is immense, and it must begin with individual growth, a consummation devoutly to be wished. The lives of all reformers attest the authenticity of their mission and call the world to acknowledge its divine principle. Truly is it written, Thou must be true thyself if thou the truth wouldst teach. Thy heart must overflow if thou another's heart wouldst reach. Science is absolute and final. It is revolutionary in its very nature, for it upsets all that is not upright. It annuls false evidence and saith to the five material senses, Having eyes ye see not, and ears ye hear not. Neither can you understand. To weave one thread of science through the looms of time is a miracle in itself. The risk is stupendous. It costs Galileo what? This awful price, the temporary loss of his self-respect. His fear overcame his loyalty. The courage of his convictions fell before it. Fear is the weapon in the hands of tyrants. Men and women of the 19th century, are you called to voice a higher order of science? Then obey this call. Go, if you must, to the dungeon or the scaffold, but take not back the words of truth. How many are there ready to suffer for a righteous cause, to stand a long siege, take the front rank, face the foe, and be in the battle every day? In no other one thing seemed Jesus of Nazareth more divine than in his faith in the immortality of his words. He said, Heaven and earth shall pass away but my word shall not pass away, and they have not. The winds of time sweep clean the centuries, but they can never bear into oblivion his words. They still live, and tomorrow speak louder than today. They are today as the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make straight God's paths, make way for health, holiness, universal harmony, and come up hither. The grandeur of the word, the power of truth, is again casting out evils and healing the sick, and it is whispered, this is science. Jesus taught by the wayside in humble homes. He spake of truth and love to artless listeners and dull disciples. His immortal words were articulated in a decaying language and then left to the providence of God. Christian science was to interpret them, and woman, last at the cross, 
was to awaken the dull senses, intoxicated with pleasure or pain, to the infinite meaning of those words. Past, present, future will show the word and might of truth, healing the sick and reclaiming the sinner, so long as there remains a claim of error for truth to deny or to destroy. Love's labors are not lost. The five personal senses that grasp neither the meaning nor the magnitude of self-abnegation may lose sight thereof. But science voices unselfish love unfolds infinite good, leads on irresistible forces, and will finally show the fruits of love. Human reason is inaccurate, and the scope of the senses is inadequate to grasp the word of truth and teach the eternal. Science speaks when the senses are silent, and then the evermore of truth is triumphant. The spiritual monitor understood is coincidence of the divine with the human, the acme of Christian science. Pure humanity, friendship, home, the interchange of love, bring to earth a foretaste of heaven. They unite terrestrial and celestial joys and crown them with blessings infinite. The Christian scientist loves man more because he loves God most. He understands this principle, love. Who is sufficient for these things? Who remembers that patience, forgiveness, abiding faith and affection are the symptoms by which our Father indicates the different stages of man's recovery from sin and his entrance into science. Who knows how the feeble lips are made eloquent, how hearts are inspired, how healing becomes spontaneous, and how the divine mind is understood and demonstrated. He alone knows these wonders who is departing from the thraldom of the senses and accepting spiritual truth, that which blesses its adoption by the refinement of joy and the dismissal of sorrow. Christian science and the senses are at war. It is a revolutionary struggle. We already have had two in this nation and they began and ended in a contest for the true idea for human liberty and rights. Now cometh a third struggle for the freedom of health, holiness, and the attainment of heaven. The scientific sense of being which establishes harmony enters into no compromise with finiteness and feebleness. It undermines the foundations of mortality, of physical law, breaks their chains, and sets the captive free, opening the doors for them that are bound. He who turns to the body for evidence bases his conclusions on mortality, on imperfection. But science saith to man, God hath all power. The science of omnipotence demonstrates but one power, and this power is good, not evil, not matter, but mind. This virtually destroys matter and evil, including sin and disease. If God is all, and God is good, it follows that all must be good, and no other power, law, or intelligence can exist. On this proof rests premise and conclusion in science, and the facts that disprove the evidence of the senses. God is individual mind. This one mind, in his individuality, 
comprise the elements of all forms and individualities, and prophesy the nature and stature of Christ, the ideal man. A corporeal God is often defined by lexicographers and scholastic theologians is only an infinite finite being, an unlimited man, a theory to me inconceivable. If the unlimited and immortal mind could originate in a limited body, mind would be chained to finity and the infinite forever finite. In this limited and lower sense, God is not personal. His infinity precludes the possibility of corporeal personality. His being is individual, but not physical. God is like himself and like nothing else. He is universal and primitive. His character admits of no degrees of comparison. God is not part, but the whole. In his individuality, I recognize the loving, divine, father-mother God. Infinite personality must be incorporeal. God's ways are not ours. His pity is expressed in modes above the human. His chastisements are the manifestations of love. The sympathy of his eternal mind is fully expressed in divine science, which blots out all our iniquities and heals all our diseases. Human pity often brings pain. Science supports harmony, denies suffering, and destroys it with the divinity of truth. Whatever seems material seems thus only to the material senses and is but the subjective state of mortal and material thought. Science has inaugurated the irrepressible conflict between sense and soul. Mortal thought wars with this sense as one that beateth the air, but science outmasters it and ends the warfare. This proves daily that one on God's side is a majority. Science defines omnipresence as universality, that which precludes the presence of evil. This verity annuls the testimony of the senses, which say that sin is an evil power and substance is perishable. Intelligent spirit, soul, is substance, far more impregnable and solid than matter, for one is temporal while the other is eternal, the ultimate and predicate of being. Mortality, materiality, and destructive forces, such as sin, disease, and death, mortals virtually name substance, but these are the substance of things not hoped for. For lack of knowing what substance is, the senses say vaguely, the substance of life is sorrow and mortality. For who knoweth the substance of good? In science, form and individuality are never lost. Thoughts are outlined, individualized ideas, which dwell forever in the divine mind as tangible, true substance because eternally conscious. Unlike mortal mind, which must be ever in bondage, the eternal mind is free, unlimited, and knows not the temporal. Neither does the temporal know the eternal. Mortal man, as mind or matter, is neither the pattern nor maker of immortal man. Any inference of the divine derived from the human, either as mind or body, hides the actual power, presence, and individuality of God. Jesus' personality in the flesh, 
so far as material sense could discern it, was like that of other men. But science exchanges this human concept of Jesus for the divine ideal, his spiritual individuality that reflected the Emmanuel, or God with us. This God was not outlined. He was too mighty for that. He was eternal life, infinite truth, and love. The individuality is embraced in mind, therefore is forever with the Father. Hence the scripture, I am a God at hand, saith the Lord. Even while his personality was on earth and in anguish, his individual being, the Christ, was at rest in the eternal harmony. His unseen individuality, so superior to that which was seen, was not subject to the temptations of the flesh, to laws material, to death, or the grave. Formed and governed by God, this individuality was safe in the substance of soul, the substance of spirit, yea, the substance of God, the one inclusive good. In science, all being is individual, for individuality is endless in the calculus of forms and numbers. Herein sin is miraculous and supernatural, for it is not in the nature of God, and good is forever good. According to Christian science, perfection is normal, not miraculous. Clothed and in its right mind, man's individuality is sinless, deathless, harmonious, eternal. His materiality, clad in a false mentality, wages feeble fight with his individuality, his physical senses with his spiritual senses. The latter move in God's grooves of science. The former revolve in their own orbits and must stand the friction of false selfhood until self-destroyed. In obedience to the divine nature, man's individuality reflects the divine law and order of being. How shall we reach our true selves? Through love. The principle of Christian science is love, and its idea represents love. This divine principle and idea are demonstrated in healing, to be God and the real man. Who wants to be mortal, or who would not gain the true ideal of life and recover his own individuality? I will love if another hates. I will gain a balance on the side of good, my true being. This alone gives me the forces of God wherewith to overcome all error. On this rests the implicit faith engendered by Christian science, which appeals intelligently to the facts of man's spirituality, individuality, to disdain the fears and destroy the discords of this material personality. On our Master's individual demonstrations over sin, sickness, and death rested the anathema of priesthood and the senses. Yet this demonstration is the foundation of Christian science. His physical sufferings, which came from the testimony of the senses, were over when he resumed his individual spiritual being after showing us the way to escape from the material body. Science would have no conflict with life or common sense if this sense were consistently sensible. Man's real life or existence is in harmony with life and its glorious phenomena. It upholds being and destroys the too common sense of its opposite, death, disease, and sin. Christian science is an everlasting victor, 
and vanquishment is unknown to the omnipresent truth. I must ever follow this line of light and battle. Christian science is my only ideal, and the individual and his ideal can never be severed. If either is misunderstood or maligned, it eclipses the other with the shadow cast by this error. Truth destroys error. Nothing appears to the physical senses but their own subjective state of thought. The senses join issue with error, and pity what has no right either to be pitied or to exist, and what does not exist in science. Destroy the thought of sin, sickness, death, and you destroy their existence. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Because God is mind, and this mind is good, all is good, and all is mind. God is the sum total of the universe. Then what and where are sin, sickness, and death? Christian science and Christian scientists will, must, have a history. And if I could write the history in poor parody on Tennyson's grand verse, it would read thus. Traitors to the right of them, MDs to the left of them, priestcraft in front of them, volleyed and thundered. Into the jaws of hate, out through the door of love, on to the blessed above, marched the one hundred. <laughs>